we finally made it. After 48 episodes, two robberies and one man disguising himself as a couch, yes, that happened, Money Heist reached its thrilling conclusion. This is not just the end of Season 5, but of all Money Heist, and what a series to go out on. The Professor got to boogie, Berlin had the world's first one-man bar fight, and we enjoyed the funkiest rendition of Bella Ciao yet. Even with the cops at the door, there's no stopping the grooviest robbers on TV. Money Heist's final run also delivered answers we've been waiting for. How to get the gold out of the bank, how to get the robbers out of the bank, and just what was the relevance of all those Berlin flashbacks. With the series wrapped up and our thieves scattered to the wind, it's time to take a look at the final episodes and break down the masterstrokes of the Professor's greatest plan yet. As if it needs to be said, beware spoilers! Let's start with the first part of the plan. How do you get 90 tonnes of gold out of a bank? Turns out it takes a smelter, an industrial oil pump, some complicated maths and one very virile oil rig worker. Siete hijos. Con siete mujeres distintas. <laughs> From the moment the gang cracked the flooded vault in part three and started melting the gold into tiny pellets, it was obvious they weren't going to transport the gold via traditional means. They were very open about the fact. Lisbon explained it to the court before being rescued using the Paris plan. El plan es robar las 90 toneladas de oro de la Reserva Nacional. Y lo que estamos haciendo ahora es fundirlo. And the professor spilled the tiny golden beans to Sierra. But she chose not to believe him. The answer came in episode 6 of part 5, where Berlin visited an oil rig in the Barents Sea, a whole five years before the Bank of Spain heist. Here we learn two things. One, that Berlin makes for a hugely fun passenger on long trips. And two, that the pumps used by the rig have the power to shift liquids at high pressure. Extrae los áridos del fondo marino como si fueran un potito. By mixing pellets with vault water, the robbers fill the drain pipes under the bank with gold. This process uses a small pump, which doesn't have the force needed to push that gold through the 11 miles of pipe from the bank to the stormwater tank, which is where Benjamin and the gang are waiting for it. Enter the industrial pump, with the raw power to flush the remaining vault water and the pipe gold all the way to the stormwater tank. Too little pressure and the gold won't get there, too much and the pipes will explode. The tricky part is manually controlling pressure and calculating the values. Palermo cites Darcy Weisbach, which is an equation in fluid dynamics used to find the impact of friction on liquids moving through a pipe. For once, the professor has met his galaxy-brained match. Estoy loco, o lo veo yo solo. The final twist in the plan? Instead of pumping the gold downhill, where the police are more likely to look, Palermo chooses to pump it upstream. Vamos a remontar el oro río arriba como lo hacen los putos salmones hacia este tanque de tormentas. So when the police turn up at the wrong stormwater tank, there's not a single gold ball in sight. Of course, maths only gets you so far. To Palermo, the plan is a love letter to his time with Berlin, and it's his faith in that plan and that relationship that pushes the gang and the gold to where they need to be. Speaking of Berlin, the drainpipe plan feels like an echo of his earlier robbery at Frederiksborg Castle where he stole Viking treasure with his son, Raphael, then used the river outside to safely transport their swag to another location. And speaking of Raphael, now's a good time to address a tiny problem in the professor's plan. No sooner have they extracted the gold by pipe and smelted it back into ingots, the team is robbed by another gang of thieves posing as policemen. Yes, the irony of robbers being robbed isn't lost on us. The culprits? Berlin's son, Raphael, and former wife, Tatiana. To pick this twist apart, let's rewind back a few years. 
In part three, we're introduced to Berlin's new bride, Tatiana, during one of the show's many flashbacks. On the plus side, it means we get another Berlin musical number. Ti amo, un solo ti amo. But the professor is alarmed that Berlin has shared his plans for the Bank of Spain heist with an outsider. Ah, por cierto, le encanta el golpe del Banco de España. Está el corriente. Staying in the past, but jumping forwards a few months, Berlin introduces Tatiana to his son, Raphael. He needs them both to rob the Danish castle. But while the Copenhagen job goes without a hitch, it ignites a spark between Raphael and Tatiana, and nervous looks in the boat blossom into a full-on affair. We'd feel bad for Berlin, but it's only what he taught his son to do. Si de verdad quieres algo en la vida, tienes que robárselo a quien lo posee. This results in the most expensive bar bill in history for a heartbroken Berlin. But in a way, it also triggers the entire money heist story. Berlin's broken heart and stint in jail for smashing the bar is what opens him up to working with his brother, the professor, on the original royal mint heist. Antes de morir, tú y yo vamos a robar la fábrica nacional de moneda y timbre. <laughs> yes, money heist is basically just a really messy breakup. Eating a massive tub of Hagen Dars would have been much easier. Back in the present, we have fun seeing the professor lose his cool for a minute. Es pianista. Y ladrona! But it's also neat seeing the family resemblance between his work and Raphael's. The idea of Raphael observing the crime scene from a bank of monitors is a classic professor move, as is the attention to detail when he and Tatiana hide the gold under the house. The total commitment to the disguise is the same as the professor dressing as a homeless man back in season one, to, yes, staple himself and Sierra inside the couch. Of course, Sierra does get the gold back. After the professor realizes Raphael and Tatiana must be hiding the loot, Sierra tracks it by looking for recently purchased land and confronts the pair of lovebirds. And reclaiming the ingots is crucial to the plan. It's the answer to the other huge question hanging over the heist. How to get the robbers out of the bank. Because while you may be able to squeeze gold pellets through 11 miles of pipe, Helsinki is more of a challenge. Sin el oro estamos perdidos, Lisboa. Entonces estamos perdidos. The short answer is, they plan to hold the gold hostage outside the bank to secure the release of the robbers inside the bank. That might sound like backwards thinking, but you have to remember that the whole point of robbing the Spanish reserve in the first place was to use it as a bargaining chip to free Rio. The gold was never the real target. For his plan to work, the professor needs to apply financial pressure to the Spanish government. It's not enough to take the gold. As Tamayo explains, the government have safety nets in place. Malas noticias, porque tengo detrás al Banco Central Europeo para inyectar liquidez o comprar deuda. To amplify the financial crisis, the robbers broadcast their successful gold heist online. In fact, watch back through the series and you'll often see characters filming on their mobile phones. No, it wasn't just inappropriate TikToks, they were documenting their heist. To further destabilize the financial markets, the professor plants fake clues to draw the police and army to search for the gold in the ocean. Filling the stormwater tank with charred remains of fake documents reminds us of the professor planting fake leads in his hideout during the Royal Mint heist. He loves a wild goose chase. The plan is named after Tom Thumb, or as he's known in Spain, Pulgacito. The original Tom Thumb story saw a tiny thumb-sized man go on wild adventures where he was passed from bird to fish, which could relate to the long journey Marseille leads Angel on in pursuit of the gold. But the Tom Thumb story is also seen as a tale about how a tiny hero can take on massive challenges, which does link nicely to a handful of robbers bringing down a financial market. With the stock market plummeting, the professor can negotiate with Tamayo and offers to return it in exchange for their freedom. This is why the whole plan hinges on retrieving the gold from Raphael and Tatiana. No bargaining chip, no escape. Which leads us to the final twist. The gold is returned, despite currently being buried under a house and trapped in a standoff between Sierra and Tatiana. Yeah, it confused us too, but this is the brilliance of the professor's plan. 
he returns brass coated in gold. An idea he had after noticing how his food tins resembled ingots. It's also an idea with a proven money heist track record. Berlin's Copenhagen job swapped Viking treasure for brass fakes. The twist hinges on the concept that the gold in the reserve is more of an idea than a valuable thing. Countries don't spend it, it just sits there, underpinning the economy. Throughout the series, people are remarking how no one can truly own the gold. After all, it just fell from space millions of years ago. And as Palermo notes of historic gold... Finally, there's Lisbon, dropping a neat literary reference to Tamayo. El lazarillo de Tormes no lo escribieron los ingleses. ¿A qué no? Lazarillo de Tormes is a novella from the Spanish Golden Age and follows a young boy mastering the art of thievery. It was so influential it invented an entire genre, the picaresque novel, taken from the word pica meaning rogue. She's almost making the case that ingenious deception and improvisation, the skills that define the professor, are a key part of the Spanish national character. And so it is they convince Tamayo to work with them. While the robbers fake their deaths to let him walk away from the siege with a bit of pride, he also has to accept the fake gold in the name of stabilising the markets. And because the robbers reclaimed the real gold from Raphael and Tatiana, they can use it as a safety net. They just need to expose its existence outside the bank to ruin the economy again. And it's this that finally secures their future. It's one hell of a plan. And so we reach the end of the Bank of Spain heist. It was not without a few tears along the way. Rest in peace, Nairobi and Tokyo, but it's also not the bloodbath some expected. There was a popular fan theory that more characters would die. Some people felt the two teams of footballers in part four represented who would live or die. And others felt Nairobi's heavenly flashback pointed towards the professor's eventual death. But it was not to be. The biggest question we still have is why they never blocked up those air vents. Between Gandia, Stockholm and Arantxa Arteche, there was always someone in the walls during parts four and five. Air vents, you are the real MVP of Money Heist. And that brings us to the end of our ending explained. Why not watch our earlier theories videos to see how they stacked up? Well, after you've done an entire Money Heist series rewatch, of course. For more videos like this, subscribe to Netflix Still Watching and we'll see you soon.